You may have heard the expression before, being saved by faith alone. And this is the teaching from the Bible that God saves us not because we've done enough good things. It's not like God looks at our life and adds up all of the good works that we've done and says, well, there's a good person, I'm going to save them, he's earned it. But rather, we are saved only by faith in Jesus Christ because we could never do enough to earn salvation. It's, it's something which God has to do through Jesus Christ. Now this is, we don't obviously have time to go into all of that teaching now, but the idea is that a lot of people seem to have this view that it's something which is only taught in the New Testament, that it's something which especially is associated with the Apostle Paul, and that it, it wasn't taught in the Old Testament. People think that God asked the, uh, the Israelites to obey the Ten Commandments simply to obey and to earn their salvation by their obedience in the Old Testament. But then God kind of realised that didn't work, people couldn't obey him, so he changed his mind and said, OK then, uh, what can I do with you? Well, just have faith instead. I know that's a caricature, but I think some people really do have that, that view that it's almost like God realised that salvation by obedience wasn't going to work in the Old Testament. So he changed his mind and said, well, I'm going to, you, you can just have faith instead. If you're not going to obey me, you can just have faith instead. Now, that's not at all how it works. That is not at all the truth. And what we're going to see in this passage from Exodus chapter 12 is that God requires faith all the way through the Bible that it's always actually salvation by faith through grace, that it was never anything different. And Exodus chapter 12 is a picture of salvation. It's actually a picture of Christ and a picture of having faith in Christ. And that's what we'll see as we, we go through. So let's look into what this passage says. And um, it's a fairly, uh, fairly long passage today, so we're just kind of going to skip through and I'll try and pick out the really important moments for us to be looking at as we go through. So this passage starts out by God saying to Moses and Aaron, giving the people, uh, giving them the instructions for this, this Passover. Remember the final plague was the, the plague of the firstborn, the, the death of the firstborn. And he says, this time I want you to do something different. And he says to them, this month is to be for you the first month of your year. The first month of your year. Now what God means by this is that this event that he's describing is so significant that it was to shape their whole calendar. It was to shape their, their entire year it was to be set by this event and it was really to say this is so significant that everything in your your calendar that your time is to be set by this now this event and this is something which we I think people do have this intuitive understanding that our calendar does reflect our priorities and does reflect what we think is important I apologise if you can hear a bit of background noise coming over. By the way, it's my neighbours doing um, a bit of work, but um, I, I hope that it's not too distracting. So it, it, it's it's a bit like today how we have secular holidays, don't we? You know, we're, we're in the middle at the moment of Pride Month and how you see the rainbow flag everywhere. And what that is doing is just saying, this is what we consider important. This is so important that we have a whole month dedicated to it because we want to we want you to agree with these these values. We want you to remember this. And you know it's been the the case all the way through human history that those who control the calendar direct what people think about and and it shows what we think of as important. And Pride Month shows what our society or or at least some in our society think is important just at the moment. But God was saying, this is to be the defining moment for you, this Passover, what I'm, what I'm going to accomplish for you uh, in the here and now. So he says, what you are to do is to tell the whole community of Israel um, 
uh, to take a lamb for the family, one for each household. And if your household is too small for a whole lamb, then share one with a neighboring household. But the idea was that each household had to have a lamb and that lamb was to feed everyone in that household. And if, uh, if there was too much, it could be shared with another household, but it was to be enough and it wasn't to be used for anything else. You know, any leftovers were to be burnt. So everyone was to have enough from this lamb and it wasn't to be excess. Now, there, was, there were to be no leftovers. So the lamb was to feed everyone and just to be just enough for them. And I think this is the first thing which says that this meal which God is asking them to eat, the Passover meal, it was a symbolic meal. It wasn't, a, it wasn't just there for their you know, nourishment in, the, in the, the way the normal meal is. It's actually a symbolic thing. It had a deeper sort of spiritual significance, which they were to understand by faith. And we see that again when God says in verse 5, the animals you choose must be year old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. So they were to be without defect. Now again, the if a, a, a lamb has a defect, it doesn't affect the taste, does it? You know, if it has, like it's, for example, if it's blind in one eye or it has a lame leg or something, it doesn't affect the taste of the lamb. But God says it has to be a lamb without defect. So again, this says this is not simply about feeding you ready to, to leave Egypt. This is actually a symbolic thing which is which is happening it has a deeper significance and he says uh, again to to emphasize this uh, there to take some of the blood of the lamb and um, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they where they eat so they, they were to kill the lamb at uh, twilight on the 14th day of the month which is the the lunar uh, full moon um, so God was kind of giving them light by, by night. That was, that was um, I think, the, why it happened on this day. And take some of the blood of the lamb and paint it over the, the, the door frame of the house. So it was to be an action that was, that was done in faith. I think that's what God is asking them to do. This whole thing is actually, it's not about eating a meal. It is about obeying God in faith saying we believe and trust in him we trust that he will do what he has promised to do and this kind of faithful faithfulness this this action of faith we see that again in how they were to eat the meal he says verse 11 this is how you you are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So again, we see that this was not just an ordinary meal, but they were to eat it ready to go, ready to, 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 to leave Egypt, ready to, to, for God to bring them out. That they were saying, we believe that God has promised to do this. And so we are going to take this in the belief and the trust that God will fulfill what he promised and take us out of Egypt. So, so it wasn't just a matter of saying, oh, you know, well, I, I, I put my faith in God and not doing anything. It was actually to say, no, you put your faith in God and you therefore you eat the meal in the way that he has directed. You know, you do, do everything with the lamb so that it is enough for everyone, but not too much. Any leftovers are burnt. You eat it in, it, it, it's prescribed they were to roast it rather than boiling it or, or what have you. And they were also to eat it ready to go. So, you know, the bags were packed, suitcases are packed, you know, the donkeys loaded up, uh, what have you, you know, it's, it, they're ready to go. That's the thing, God has said, I'm going to do this and they believed they had faith and so they were ready to put that faith into action 
That's what we see here, that that faith gets translated into action in the way that they ate the meal and in them being ready to go, to, to believe that God would lead them out of, of Egypt. And God says, uh, he moves on to what was going to happen that night. And he says, uh, on that same night, this is verse 12, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So the blood of the lamb on over the, the door frame of the house was to be a, a sign that the people trusted God and God would pass over that house when he was bringing about the plague, the death of the firstborn. Now, it's important to, to say that previously God had just treated the Israelites differently, that the land of Goshen where the Israelites lived was somewhere that was treated differently and there was no, um, there's no need for the Israelites to actually do anything. You know, it was just God treated them differently. But this time God asks them to sacrifice the lamb and to paint the blood over the doorframe and to do things in, in his way. So God actually says, no, this time you need to do something that he's bringing a plague and they need to put that faith into action. So that's something that's, that's um, really important. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, why does God say, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt? Because you might think, well, surely there aren't any gods of Egypt in the sense that, well, for example, we, we've looked at this a few times. The Egyptians believed that the Nile was a god. So why? You know, the Nile's not a god, it's a river. So why then does God say, I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt if those gods don't exist? And I think that is the point, actually, that God is making, which is not that, uh, that the God is bringing judgment on other gods, but rather that they are going to be exposed as not gods. That all of these so-called gods that the Egyptians believed in, God was going to show them up to be not gods at all. In other words, God, in a sense, was judging the faith in those gods, the, the faith that the Egyptians put in those gods, not the gods themselves, because there were no gods to be judged, if, if that kind of makes sense. So God is bringing judgment on the Egyptians for the faith that they put in, in those gods and exposing them for what they are, just worthless idols. And then, uh, so then in these next few verses, verses 14 to 20, uh, God gives instructions for the Passover and we won't go into this in in detail because um, again these are things which are repeated but something which is which is significant God says in verse 14 this is a day you are to commemorate where the generations to come you celebrate it as a festival to the Lord a lasting ordinance and this is what is known through the Old Testament as the festival of unleavened bread or sometimes um, the Passover, the Passover festival. So God says you are to remember this day. Again, like him saying that this is going to be the first month of your year, he says you're to hold a festival to remember this every year. And that's because God is saying it's important for them to remember. We as human beings, we have short memories don't we and um, i mean i i've my memory is is terrible sometimes i can get up and think oh i need to do this that or the other and then two seconds later i've forgotten what i got up to do maybe you have this as well uh, i think it's quite a common human problem but you know we really struggle with memory don't we especially when we're going through hard times or times of suffering that it's very easy when we go through those times to focus only on the suffering that we're going through at that present moment and forget all of the blessings and the benefits that God has given us in the past. It's 
it's the human condition is our our forgetfulness and what God is saying to them is no you need to remember it's so important for you to remember that you it will give you it will it will be the necessary thing for you to preserve over the, the, the coming time you know when they're in the promised land and so on to remember God to remember what he's done for them so they won't become hard-hearted and be ungrateful towards God and that's why I think this instruction is included here when God is describing the actual and in this narrative of the the, the Passover because it reminds the people why they're celebrating it reminds the people why they celebrate the Passover because it's actually there in the story of the Passover. So after this, um, Moses and Aaron, they call the people together. And it's, well, it says Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and he just reports back to them what they are to do. So he basically explains to the people what God has already told him. And there are a couple of things about this which really uh, struck me. One of the things was, it says in verse 26 and 27, When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. So Moses actually includes the children in this, in this sort of passing this faith and knowledge on to the next generation and I think that's something which is really significant something which I've I've become more aware of I think over the last few years is how important it is to pass the faith on to to children and to the next generation how important that that children's uh, ministry is and I think a lot of people it does run contrary to our our culture today where we tend to think well we'll we'll hand children over to, to the professionals who will do it on our behalf so we hand children over to schools to be educated and so we hand children over to Sunday school teachers to teach them the faith but I think it's so important as Moses says when your children ask why do you do this then tell them Moses is saying that we need to be teaching our children the faith. No, it's, they are your responsibility as parents to be, to be teaching them. That we mustn't have a you know, hand it over to the professionals mentality. You know, we mustn't think I will le delegate teaching my children the faith to someone else. We, you know, we have to lead by example. We have to do it ourselves. And this was a battle that I faced often in our in our old church particularly when I think there were people who had this attitude that you know they would come to church send their children off to Sunday school and then they wouldn't talk about God or Jesus the rest of the week and of course children are not going to grow up in that situation being knowing what it means to follow Jesus that children need to be taught day by day week by week what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to obey him and just to be I think it's so important to show your children your faith and talk to them about the Bible, pray with them, help them to know what it means to follow Jesus. It's, it's your responsibility as a parent. And we'll, we'll have more to say about that in just a moment. And, and then it says, the Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And this is, I think, demonstrating what is called in the New Testament, this is a, a phrase which comes from Romans chapter 1 verse 5, the obedience that comes from faith. And this is where I think a lot of the time we get things wrong because if we think we're either justified by faith or justified by obedience. And the New Testament is very clear that we are justified only by faith, but that that faith then leads to obedience. That's the thing. If we have faith in God, if we have faith in Christ Jesus, then that changes how we live and how we act. And that the Israelites obeyed God because they had faith in him. They listened to him because they had faith. It wasn't that they God chose them because they were obedient, 
but because they had faith in him, they obeyed him. And I think that's the right way round that it goes, that the faith comes first and then the faith changes how we live. And of course, we need to recognise that obedience is not something, again, which comes from human strength, but comes from the power of God in, in the Holy Spirit. But uh, again, that's not the, the main topic that we're looking at uh, today. So the, this, the passage that we're going to look at today just finishes off with God carrying out what he's already said that he's going to do. It is the death of the firstborn, exactly as he promised. And it says, um, there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. You know, from the greatest, from Pharaoh to, to the, the prisoner in the dungeon and the livestock as well, that God has struck down the firstborn in all the families in Egypt, those who didn't have the blood on their, their doorposts, who hadn't obeyed God. And it, it struck me that it was fitting that God should conclude the plagues like this, because this was how it all began. Back in Exodus chapter 1, you recall, if you've been with us since then, that the uh, a previous Pharaoh had actually commanded that the Israelite children be, be killed and even to be thrown into the Nile. He said that in, in, in Exodus chapter 1. And it's exactly what God does to them, what the Egyptians had done to the Israelites, killed their their children. So it was fitting actually that this should be this should be the way that that God deals with them. And um and yeah, it, it happens exactly as God God promised. So we'll have to leave the story there for the time being. I know it's an exciting story and we want to we want to carry on to to, to keep on going and I'm finding that as I go through it's a great it's a great tale, it's a great story. Um, I mean, it's true, of course. It's a true story, but you know, you want to carry on and find out what happens, don't you? But we'll, we'll pause there, and we'll just think about what lessons that we we have to learn from this, because, as I said, this is actually teaching us about Christ. This is teaching us about Christ, and we as Christians need to look at the passages like this, but especially the Passover, and say that. This is teaching us about Christ because the New Testament does make clear that Christ is the Passover lamb. That God, when he was giving the, um, the Israelites this Passover, was actually just giving them a picture of what he was going to do in Christ. So this is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Um, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. That's what the, um, the Apostle Paul says, that Christ is our Passover lamb. And he is the one who was sacrificed for us. And his blood is what keeps us safe. And this is, um, just to, to prove it again uh, to you, this is what it says elsewhere in the New Testament. So let me quote to you from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. With the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And you think about what God asked the Israelites to do, to, to, to select a lamb that had no defects. That Christ was the perfect lamb, the sinless lamb, who was slain for us and his blood saves us. And that's the thing, that in Christ we have salvation and we have security. We need not fear the, the angel of destruction. We need not fear death because we know that in Christ we are safe, saved through his blood, uh, because he was sacrificed on our behalf. And this is, let me just quote you one more verse here, John chapter 3 and verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, 
But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So God says to them that anyone who believes in Jesus has eternal life, but whoever rejects Jesus does not have eternal life, for God's wrath remains on them. So what distinguishes us is not putting blood on the doorposts, but whether we believe and have faith in Jesus or not. Now, our attitude towards Jesus, that's what differentiates us in the end. So Jesus is the big dividing line in humanity, how we respond to Jesus. Now, what can we learn from, from this? If we think about Jesus as our Passover lamb, what can we learn from what God said to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 12? Well, there are three things that I wanted to mention briefly. The first one is, do we remember? Do we remember? Because as I said, it's very easy to forget. God thought it was so important for the Israelites to remember that he gave, he said that this is to be the first month of their year and he gave them an annual festival for them to remember. But think about what Jesus gave to his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me when he gave them uh, the, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine. And I think, again, this, this message of remembering is, is as important for Christians as it was to the Old Testament Israelites, that we are to remember day by day what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And I don't think that means that, as some churches do, they some churches sort of go the whole hog and, and actually take communion every single day. And I, I don't think that that's necessarily what Jesus implied here. I mean, you think that the Feast of Unleavened Bread was an annual festival. But what I think it means is we need to remember every day what Jesus has done. We need to remember, we need to be reading the Bible. We need to be praying. We need to be drawing near to God. You know, that becoming a Christian isn't something that you do kind of, you just do once and then you forget about Jesus for the rest of the time. That's not what it means to become a Christian. That actually it means that we need to walk with God and we need to daily be repenting of our sins, coming to him, asking for his help, asking for the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what we need to be doing every day if we are to remember what it means to be saved. You know, we need to be living in the light of the cross, really, if, if you want to put it like that. The second thing is we need to make a priority of teaching children. There was a someone I know from my, my old um, Bible college who went off to Uganda to be, um, well, to be a missionary and to teach in a seminary in Uganda. And uh, the church that they, they went to had, I think, 400 children coming to the Sunday school. You think about that, 400 children coming to Sunday school. And it's incredible you know, to think about that. Um, in you know if we had that in this country that would be you know extraordinary but that's what they had and uh, the thing was though that I think the Sunday school was not really seen as very important I think the Ugandans thought that the main church was what was the important thing and the Sunday school was just something for, for kids to do while they had the proper thing in church and actually what he said to them is you know think about the problems in England because, you know, he said the Ugandans thought that England was a very Christian country. But he said, no, it's not. There are very few Christians now. And he said that the reason is because we haven't been teaching children and young people the faith. Because we haven't made that a priority. And he said to them, if you don't teach children the Christian faith, how to follow Jesus, they are going to grow up and not be Christian. And you're going to end up as England is now. I think a lot, so many of the problems in the church that we that we are facing at the moment are stem from the fact that we do, we have not made a priority of teaching children and teaching young people the faith through the 20th and the early 21st century. Just I just don't think we've done it very well at all, and we're reaping the fruit of that now. That so many young people are abandoning Christianity. And um, we need to make a priority of children's ministry and, and young people's ministry 
if the church is to grow and to flourish because they are really that they really are the future of the church you know they are uh, they're not you know just the church future but they, they should be part of it now and we should make that a priority to teach them now and um, something which it is I would say is that if you don't have children yourself then you know that's obviously that that each parent has the responsibility for their own children but actually in the church we are one family and that everyone in the church I think should have the responsibility for the children in that church and what that means is that even if you don't teach Sunday school you're not directly responsible in that in that way to remember the children in your prayers you know, to be praying for them to be praying for their parents to help out in any any way that you can but especially I think just to pray and remember the children that they're they're not to be forgotten actually but as we pray for those in our church we pray for the children and, and include them in our prayers as well and ask that God would bless them and help them to grow up to know and to love him the third and final thing I wanted to mention is this question of do we obey that is faith for us just something which we say that we have or is it something which actually makes a difference to our lives because I think some people say they have faith but then they don't ever do anything kind of remotely resembling Christ, you know, Christianity they don't read the Bible they don't pray they don't go to church even and this is the thing that having faith must make a difference that it wouldn't have made any it wouldn't have been any good for the Israelites if they'd have said to um, well I believe that God is I believe that you know in God but I'm not going to um, sacrifice a lamb I'm not going to paint the blood I'm not going to eat the meal like that I'm just going to that wouldn't wouldn't have saved them in the end would it that faith actually asks us to put things into practice and that's what we we need to be doing let me read you what Peter says again going back to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 21 to 25 through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in God now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other love one another deeply from the heart for you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God for all, all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of the Lord endures forever and this is the word that was preached to you so I think what Peter is saying is that now that we've been redeemed we live as those who were redeemed now that we've come to believe in him who saved us and who has redeemed us then we live a life of of love we seek to live a life of love and as I said this is not something which we do in our own strength by human power but as we turn to God we we recognize our own frailty we recognize our own sinfulness we pray and ask God for the love which we we don't have in ourselves that he would give us that love and that he would help us to love others as he wants sincerely from the heart and that's what Peter is saying and that's what we need to be praying for and asking for as we go through that's the difference that faith should make in our lives so let's take a moment to pray as we come to an end and I, I do hope that the um, the noise from next door hasn't been too distracting but uh, it's just going just at the moment just as we finish but, but let's let's take a moment to pray and ask that God would help us regardless of the noise or not so Heavenly Father we do commit ourselves to you and pray that you would give us the faith that would not just be um, we would not just say with our lips that we believe but that it will make a real difference in our lives help us to walk with you every day and help us Lord to have a sincere love for one another and we pray that you would help us to have a concern a real concern for children for young people how we might bring them up to know and love you we pray that it, uh, if we have children ourselves or whether we're um, we don't but perhaps we're in a church with uh, with children in we just pray lord that you would help us to love them 
and support them in the best way that we can, whatever that might involve. So please help us, Lord, every day to walk with you and to obey you and to trust in your salvation. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.